Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story is called The Olefsky Ambush. And in case you're starting to think that it refers to a tactical maneuver in a great battle... Truthfully, we must inform you that it's nothing but a masterstroke in the game of chess. Now then, what does chess have to do with the army? Well, there was a young soldier who made one move on a chessboard and, uh... Well, we'll get to our first act curtain in just a moment. But first, young men, let's talk about your future and America's future. They're important to each other, you know, and to you. Today, your United States Army is charged with a vital responsibility. Well, you only need to glance at your local newspaper to realize how vital. And to meet this responsibility, the Army is rapidly expanding its forces. They have a job for you, a job that must be done by men of courage. You can get full details of how you may best serve your future and your country's future by a visit to your nearest United States Army recruiting station. Do it today. And now your United States Army presents the proudly we hail production, The Olefsky Ambush. I put 18 years in this army, so there are times when I think I know everything. On the other hand, there are times when I'm convinced I don't know anything. I enlisted before World War II, and I served in a lot of outfits, and I soldiered with a lot of people. I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because you'd think that a guy like me should certainly know the score by now. Well, I do know the score. But there are times when I kind of don't know what game is being played. Like, for instance, this thing with Holiday. Now, I'm, uh, I'm first sergeant in a rifle company stationed near Frankfurt in Germany. If you were to ask me which guy in the outfit was least likely to go AWOL, I would have to say Holiday. See, Holiday's a college boy. He's serious. He reads books. He wears glasses. And, and what do you think interests Holiday? Halliday is a chess fiend. Uh, the first that I knew that Halliday was AWOL was when I took Reveille one morning and 4th Platoon reported one man absent. I liked to have had a fit when I found out who it was. So I took the morning report into the old man for a signature, and it was all that he could do to believe it. Halliday? Yes, sir. I don't believe it. He's AWOL, Captain. What's the story, Sergeant Mulpey? Uh, Halliday put in for a three-day pass. That's right. I remember he wanted to go to Munich to compete in a chess tournament. Well, the pass was up at midnight. He wasn't at formation this morning, so technically he's AWOL. Technically, legally, actually. There's no question about it. What do you think, Sergeant? I think Halliday must have missed a connection somewhere, and he's hightailing back here as fast as he can. I wish he'd called in so we could have given him an extension. Oh, four men, Halliday. I'll tell you what, Sergeant. Let's hold off for a little while, anyhow, huh? We'll give him a couple of more hours to show up. Then again, he could be deep in some chess game. I understand some of those fellas lose all track of time. <laughs> Imagine a guy going AWOL to play chess. Well, then, sir, you don't want to do anything about Halliday right now. Well, uh, not right this minute, anyhow. I'm convinced he'll show up. Let's, uh, let's keep it in the company as long as we can. That gives you an idea of the type of guy Captain Parati is. Don't peg him as a softy, either. I've seen the good captain when he was throwing a book, but he was sure, you see, that Halliday was on the level with a legitimate excuse, and he was prepared to stick his neck out and go all the way down the line for him. Well, we waited all morning for Halliday, at least for word from him, but there was nothing. The whole day passed, and there wasn't a sign of him. Couldn't understand it. You see, you see, this business of AWOL, now, you get, you get some of it in the Army, but it, it's usually unstable guys or guys who hate what they're doing or just don't care. But, I mean, how do you figure Holiday? Serious, sensible, he liked the outfit, he liked all the guys. A man like Holiday just doesn't walk away. But he did. So there, all my experience and figuring how to go out the window. Then, late one afternoon, four days later, this German civilian shows up in the orderly room. What can I do for you? 
Is it uh, possible, Sergeant, to pay a social call on one of your soldiers? Yeah, it's possible. Who do you want to see? A soldier by the name of Halliday, uh, William Halliday. What's your name? Uh, Schneider. You can tell him Mr. Hans Schneider is calling, if you please. Yeah, sit down, Mr. Schneider. I'd like to tell Halliday you're here, but I can't. You see, uh, I can't because Halliday is AWOL. Uh, excuse me? Absent without leave. Oh. We haven't seen him since he went to Munich on pass. Now, suppose you tell me who you are and what's your business with Halliday. Well, um, well, I sell life insurance, and I play chess, and I, I went to Munich for the, uh, the tournament. There I met your soldier. He's a very, very good player. He, he won, you know. No, I didn't know. You saw Halliday at the tournament? Yes, he was there at all times. He was undefeated, so he played morning session and afternoon and night. You say he's not here? He did not return? When was the last time that you saw Halliday? On uh, well, Monday, it was, the last night. I was pleased uh, when I learned he was stationed here in Frankfurt, so I said, we, we must play together chess sometime. He said, yes. He's a master. He uses the van all opening. It's almost impossible to defeat. <laughs> That's not what you asked me. I said to him, I'm driving to Frankfurt in the morning. Can you ride with me? He said, no, I must take the train, or else I shall be late for... Um, <laughs> what was the word? Uh, formation. Yeah, did he take the train? Well, of course. That is, the tournament was finished. Many people were leaving for the railroad station. He went with them. You say he has not arrived? Uh, Mr. Scheid, let me have your address. Yes, sir. I live at number 71 Krone Prince Strasse. 71 Krone. Yeah, I got it. Why do you suppose he's not here? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure that he's not AWOL. <laughs> Sir, this proves Halliday went to Munich to play chess. According to this guy Schneider, that's all Halliday did once he got there. He played practically till it was time to take the train back. As far as Schneider knows, Halliday left for the station. I won't fight against anything you said, Sergeant, but where is Halliday? What did he do? Run into another chess game on his way to the train? Is that what's been holding him all week? Halliday never got on the train, sir. How do you know? If he did, he'd have been back here. And I'll bet Halliday isn't AWOL either. Something happened to him, sir, when he left the hotel where they were holding the tournament. And I'll tell you something else I found out here in the outfit. What's that? Halliday left the week before payday. He was almost broke. Sergeant Downs tells me that Halliday borrowed 20 bucks from him to make the trip. Eh, just that I can't imagine what could have happened to him. Now, look, Maltby, the MPs and the civilian police in Munich have Halliday's full description. But I think they ought to know what this fellow Schneider told you. Write it up and we'll send it out. Well, sir... What is it? I think I'm due for a three-day pass myself. Does the captain think I can have it now? Where do you want to go? <laughs> That's a real good question. If I could get a pass, I'd be headed for Munich myself. The captain signed my pass, and I was in Munich the next morning. I went to the military police headquarters, and there was a tech sergeant there named Peterson, who I knew back in the States. He was now with the Provo Marshal's office. We chewed the rag a little about old times, and then I told him the new stuff I had on Halliday. Well, we've been looking for your boy Halliday, and the civilian cops are cooperating, but none of us are getting anywhere. Tell me, as far as you know, does he speak German? Well, just a little, not too much. Well, it isn't easy for an American soldier to hide out here. He'd have been spotted around town. I don't think he's in Munich. Listen, he didn't want to go AWOL. Well, I'll buy that for now. So? So what could have happened to him on the way to the station? Well, nothing. It's less than a quarter of a mile from where they played chess to the station, a crowded street, well lit. He had no dough on him, you say, so that rules out a holdup. Did he get into some kind of fight? I can't imagine why or what. Was he hurt bad? Well, we checked the doctors in the hospitals. Go all the way. Was he killed? What happened to his body? I'm not thinking of anything like that. There are only two possible answers, Peterson. First, he could have been kidnapped. Well, why? After all, who is he? What is he? Who needs him? Who wants him? What for? I don't know what for. Well, what's the second possibility? He saw something, or he learned something. Something so important that he had to follow it up, even if it meant being AWOL. Yeah, what? Well, now, look, just because I can't answer that, it doesn't mean it isn't possible. All you got to do is start with what I'm starting with, and that is that Halliday intended to come back to the outfit on time. At the last minute, something came up. Uh, you know what the French say, look for the dame. No, no, not, not Halliday. This was his first trip to Munich. I, who did he know here? You mean he's going to walk down the street, take one look at some dame and say, Honey, you're it. I'm throwing everything away for you. Let's go. Uh, Maltby, I got to admit one thing. It beats me. 
Now, what could have happened to Halliday, and why? Now you're talking. Where's this hotel where they play chess? Peterson and I drove over to the hotel which housed the Munich Chess Association. A couple of elderly guys were sitting around playing a game. Oh, yeah, they remembered Holiday, all right, the most brilliant player they ever saw. But what could they tell us? He was there for three days, he played chess, he won the tournament, and he left for Frankfurt. We went downstairs to the coffee shop for lunch. We could have eaten at any one of a number of places, but Peterson knew all the restaurants in town, and since this was a Tuesday, he knew that the house special was a terrific Wiener schnitzel. So anyhow, the waitress finally showed up to take our order, and the waitress turned out to be Lady Luck. Uh, Fräulein. Yeah, mein Herr? Uh, Kaffee bitte. Yeah, gewiss. I don't know what I can tell you, Mulvey. Well, I can tell you one thing, Pete. Holiday is not the AWOL type. Holiday is not the kind of kid who gets into trouble. Now, let me tell you something, Mulvey. You and I have been around a long time. We should have learned something. Why? Well, we should have learned that you can really never get to know a guy. Now, there's another side to this Holiday. That's the side that's just produced an AWOL. Yeah, let, let's say he's missing, not AWOL. I'll say anything you want. The fact is, you call the roll of formation back at the outfit, and Holiday doesn't answer present. I'll take the black coffee, thank you. Uh, that will be all? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Seaton. Now listen, Pete, I admit this holiday thing has gotten me dizzy, but while you were sounding off about him just now, the waitress, the waitress, when you mentioned Halliday's name, she kind of looked at you, stood still till you finished talking, and then she gave us the coffee. Think, no, it wasn't my imagination. Uh, you're going to make me as nutty over this holiday deal as you are. Now you're beginning to see things. But just to show you the kind of guy I am, I'm going to follow up on everything. The nuttier, the better. Fräulein... Is there something else? Uh, my friend, the sergeant here, seems to have noticed that you seem to be kind of interested in what we were talking about just before. Oh, I am sorry. Were you uh, trying to listen to us talking? Well, yes. What were we saying that you found so interesting? You spoke a name that was familiar to me. Holiday. What does the name Holiday mean to you? Well, if he is a soldier, and yeah, he must be one. I... Well, you know, you meet someone, and then you hear his name spoken. You... Will you stop to listen? It is natural, no? You know a soldier named William Halliday? Well, I met him. When? Oh, it was last week at the tournament. You see, when they had the chess club meeting, I go upstairs to serve coffee while they play. And he was the only American soldier, and, well, not at all bad-looking, so I watched him. My father liked chess, and I know something about the game, and I like to watch a good player. Uh, when was the last time you saw him? The night the tournament was finished. He, he left. You haven't seen him since? No, sir. Is something wrong with him? He looked like such a nice young man. Did uh, he seem to be all right that night? I mean, did he seem nervous? Would you say that there was anything unusual about the way he acted? Well, I, I was very busy serving coffee. Yeah, I know, but try to think. During the tournament, didn't something, some little thing, I don't care what it was, did, did you notice anything that might be a little strange? No, sir. Well, at least you know him by sight. Now, if you should happen to see him around town anywhere, would you tell the nearest policeman or get in touch with me? My name is Sergeant Peterson at the Provo Marshal's office at the American Military Headquarters. Well, yeah, but I... I... Let us know if you see him. Yes, I will. It was the most doggone thing you ever saw. Holiday disappeared and we couldn't pick up a single lead. Well, we did get a lucky break, as I said, but we didn't know it at the time because we didn't know this waitress knew more than she told us. But it wasn't her fault. It happened that she knew more than she thought she did. We uh, would have felt better sooner if we knew what was going through her mind when she went home that night. What is the matter with you, Ilse? With me? Nothing. All evening, you have just sat quietly. You have not heard anything I have said. I am sorry, Uncle Carl. No. You are troubled about something. I can always tell. Ah, uh, you work too hard in that hotel. No. And it is my fault. If only I could play the piano again. Ah. There are more casualties to war than you read in the journals. But I saw her pressman at lunch. He said perhaps there will be some arranging work for me. And that would be nice, no, Ilse? Ilse. What were you saying, Uncle? Now, you must tell me. What is troubling you? You remember the chess player I told you about? The handsome young American soldier? No doubt. He has disappeared. Disappeared? Oh, the army has probably sent him to another post. No, no, he has disappeared from the army. Oh, that is serious. You must tell me, Ilse, 
Was there anything between you? Oh, Uncle, I do not think he would even know me if he saw me. I just happened to notice him at the tournament. In the coffee shop today, two American sergeants were talking about it. I think it is quite serious. But, Uncle, how can I go to the Americans and tell them something that seems so... so... And besides, it was my imagination. I'm sure of it. I do not think you should go to the authorities at all. I think you should stay away. Keep out of those things. Besides, what do you know? The very last match he played, it was against... I remember the name because it was written on a cable card. A Dr. Gröner. I can follow chess, but this was very much over my head what they were doing. Dr. Gröner moved the queen, and I noticed the American looked at him with amazement. Then the American moved his castle, and... And they both looked at each other. Men look at each other when they play chess. But not like that. When Dr. Gröner moved his queen, it was as though he did something he should not have. And when the American looked at him, it was with amazement. And then there was a, a, a strange sort of smile on his face. I am positive the authorities would not be interested in this. Then the match was over, and as everyone was leaving, I heard Dr. Gröner say to the American, may I walk to the station with you? But you see, Uncle Carl, the American never reached the station. He left the hotel and he has not been seen since. I see. Would they laugh at me if I told them a story like this? Should I go to them? Well, you must decide that for yourself. What would you do, Uncle? I? I would look at my right hand and remember the day the Americans attacked the Nazi. Ah, who am I to talk? Did I not fire a rifle, too? Do I know where all my bullets landed? I want to do the right thing, Uncle. Yes, one should always do the right thing. Especially if the man is young and handsome, huh? You are listening to the proudly we hail production, The Olevsky Ambush, and we will return in just one moment for the second act. Today, you young men of America have an excellent opportunity to learn a trade which will assure your future. The many fine technical schools of the United States Army are training men in such interesting fields as radio, radar, meteorology, mechanics, electronics, oh, so many, many fields. You can become a qualified technician trained to do an important job and what's more important, to do it right. So for full details about an exciting career, you visit your nearest United States Army recruiting station. There's no obligation... So plan ahead. Face your tomorrow today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of The Olefsky Ambush. <laughs> Private William Halliday, stationed with the United States Infantry in Frankfurt, Germany was an unusual type of soldier in that his hobby was chess, and he played it like a master. He had asked for a three-day pass to go to Munich to compete in a chess tournament. Halliday, a fine, efficient soldier, had no trouble getting the pass, but unaccountably, Halliday never returned from the tournament. First Sergeant Maltby is willing to bet his life that Halliday did not go AWOL. Sergeant Maltby had gone to Munich where he met Sergeant Peterson of the Provo Marshal Office. There is a waitress in the hotel where the tournament was held who thinks she knows something about Halliday's completely baffling disappearance. You think then, Ilsa, that something must have clicked between Halliday and this Dr. Gruner? Clicked? Well, something passed between them. It seemed that it was a strange moment. Oh, excuse me. Sergeant Peterson. Yeah, I did. I'll appreciate it, uh huh? Anything more on him, Inspector? Okay. Uh, let me have his address. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, that was the info I asked the civilian police about on Dr. Gruner. Not too much. He's not a medical doctor. He's a scientist. Physics is his field. He works for the Lothar Motor Company in town. Has no record. I got his address. Well, what, what's the connection between these two guys? Halliday, an American, Gruner, a German. They never met, never saw each other before. So what was this, this click that Elsa spotted? Now, you heard Dr. Gruner say, may I walk to the station with you. So what happened then? Did Halliday go with him? He, I saw him leave with Dr. Gruner. Now, there you got it. This Dr. Gruner either convinced Halliday not to go back to Frankfurt or else he prevented him. Or else he doesn't know anything about it. I, I'm afraid of this Dr. Gruner. 
I do not like the way he looked at Halliday. I'll tell you something I happen to learn in all these years. I learned to go by a woman's intuition. What do you think, Pete? I would have barged right into Dr. Gruner's house and said, what do you know about a man named Halliday? But my boy, Sergeant Peterson, happens to be a professional. He knows how these things should work. So we went to the Lothar Motor Company, and we didn't ask to see Gruner. Peterson remembered that working in the personnel department was a woman named Frau Elena Reinemuth. This Frau Reinemuth had a daughter who once needed a certain drug to save her life, and the Army heard about it and got the drug for her. Well, this made Frau Reinemuth the type of woman to whom Peterson could talk freely to a certain extent. Dr. Gröner has been with our research department since 1950. He is a very valuable man. Uh, where is he from? He is an East Prussian, originally from Königsberg. Uh, that's in the red occupation zone now, isn't it? Yes. Uh, how long has he been in Munich? Um, four years. Where was he before that? According to the record here, he was in Königsberg until 1949, when he escaped across the border to the American zone. Well, Königsberg is kind of far from the border. How did he get there? He was engaged in research, and his work took him to East Berlin, and from there he escaped. <sighs> and all we really know about him is from 1949 on. Yes. Sergeant... May I ask if you have any reason to suspect anything about Dr. Gröner? He seems to be a fine gentleman. Well, there's no way we can trace his background before 1949. He has his documents, his diploma from the University of Weimar, various technical articles he has written. He has a very good record, it seems. Uh, tell me, is there anything that tells about his having played chess? No, there is nothing about his being a chess player. Frau well, Reinemuth, I'd appreciate it very much if you didn't mention to him that we were here at all. Pete, when do we get to talk with Gruner? I don't think we're going to get to talk to Gruner at all. I don't think this guy's real name is Gruner. I'm going back to the office to draw my 45. What? This isn't even a job for Provo Marshal. Well, the beginning of it is. When I tell the captain what I've been doing, he'll tell me to take a squad and some German cops and bring Gruner in. From then on, intelligence takes over. Yeah, but what about Holiday? We'll bring Halliday back. If... If what? If he's alive. Well, they weren't going to keep me out of it. I borrowed a pistol and went along. There were five of us and two German cops with a search warrant. We stopped a little way from Dr. Gruner's house, and Peterson decided to walk in first, big and innocent. And there wasn't anything Pete could do to keep me from walking in with him either. Now, for crying out loud, Maltby, keep your mouth shut and let me talk, huh? Yes? Are you Dr. Gruner? Yes. I'm Sergeant Peterson, Provo Marshal's office. I wonder if I could talk to you? With me? Yeah, could we come in? I... Yes. Will you sit down? Oh, thank you. An American soldier named Halliday played chess with you last week. Now, we understand that you and he left for the railroad station together... Now, that's the last anyone's seen of Halliday. Could you tell us what you know about it? Oh, I, I remember him, yes. Well, I walked a few blocks with him, and then we parted. I came home. What has happened to Halliday? We thought maybe you could tell us. I saw him last on the night you mentioned. I have not seen him since. You say your name is Dr. Otto Gruner? It is. Dr. Gruner. Do you have any objection if we search your house? Uh, of course I have objection. You, you have no right your to... Your house to... is surrounded right now by military and civilian police. What have you done with Halliday? Sergeant, I, are you serious? Cover him, Maltby. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, this is an atrocity. It sure is, Gruner, and you're trying to commit it. Now, Fritz, Wolfgang... Don't try anything, buddy. Fritz, put out, Pete. Tear gas, get him. <laughs> I can't see. No, neither can I. He's getting away. <laughs> try and get to the window. Hey, Connolly! Evans, we've been gassed. Cover that joint. Get help. Pete, we got to get out of this room. We're dead ducks in here. <laughs> Can you see anything, Pete? Just try to head for the air. Don't worry. They won't get away. Somehow we managed to make the street. All of our guys had taken cover and were keeping the building under fire. Finally, a half-track pulled up with MPs who had gas masks, and they worked their way into the building. They flushed out Gruner and a couple of his buddies. 
And who do you think brought up the rear looking sleepy and hungry and with a week's growth of beard but my boy Halliday? Sarge, I, uh, I was playing chess, and to uh, tell you the truth, I, I didn't even look at the man's face opposite me. Uh, he was just an opponent, that's all. I thought I had him checkmated, but suddenly he made, he made two moves. Well, you have to understand about chess. But what he did was known as the Olevsky ambush. Only one guy in the whole world ever played that way. A Russian chess player named Olevsky. How do you know? Sergeant, I read books. Well, anyhow, I looked at this fellow and I said to him, Is your name Olevsky? Well, he just seemed to get a little confused, and he said, uh, may I take that move back? Well, then, we left for the station. The next thing I know, some fellow jabbed a gun in my ribs. They got me into a car. They brought me to the house. So I wasn't, they kept me locked up in the garret. For the life of me, I can't figure out why. A week went by, and then, then I heard shooting downstairs, and, well, <laughs> here we are. Well, the intelligence section cracked your boy Gruner, all right. His name is Olevsky. He's a red agent. And back home, he was a scientist and a chess player. They rigged him up with the papers of a dead scientist named Gruner. He was doing good work for them, too. But he had a weakness. He was only human. He liked to play chess. Well, he came up against a hotshot like you, Halliday, and he was forced for the first time to go into his bag of tricks. And he did something he shouldn't have. He made a play that would have made sense only to a guy like you. But he didn't know it. Well, you mean I... I actually played chess with... with the great Olevsky? That shows you. Here was a guy, Olevsky, who was one of the most dangerous red agents in Munich. And who trapped him? My boy, Halliday. And Halliday didn't even know what he was doing. Halliday was just playing chess. Today, your United States Army needs intelligent young men with ability and ambition. Men intelligent enough to recognize the vital need for a strong armed force. Men with ability enough to be trained in a necessary job. Men with ambition enough to secure the future for themselves and their loved ones. Does this description fit you? Hmm? Can you qualify? Well, for full information on how you can fit in with the finest, check with your nearest United States Army recruiting station. Now remember... The United States Army needs you. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail. Presented transcribed in cooperation with this radio station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Army. And this is Richard Hayes speaking. And inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs> <laughs>